My brothers and sisters, I come to you again um, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, to share the word of God uh, with you. Now, we are discussing who God is and in the course of this discussion, what we are also pointing out is that much of the heretical teachings that came into the church, and by church I don't mean Christian fellowship, I mean the church, um, not a particular denomination, I mean the church. I'm saying much of the heretical teachings that came into the into the church even during the apostolic times many of the heresies had to do with people taking away from Christ Jesus some of his characteristics some of the attributes of his person or trying to overemphasize some attributes and undermine others. And this is why you got so much corrective teaching in the epistles of the apostles. And the apostle John has even much stronger words to say about people who fail to rightly divide scriptures regarding the nature of God and he clearly just brands them with the label Antichrist and we shall have time to discuss what he says <clears throat> now what I want to do is to again sum up what I've covered in the previous two um, sessions we established that Jesus is eternal Jesus is divine, which means he is God. He always was God before anything was created and continued to be and continues to be unto eternity. He does not change. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always God. He is immutable. That's a... a that's an attribute of God. Uh, I have shown in my discussion and presentation that he truly was God, the form of God. And I've shown that he truly was man. He took the form of a servant but was likened unto us human beings. And I emphasize that we should be careful not to overstretch the point of him being like us and claim that we are identical to him. It will be erroneous on our part to think like that. Because he had a virgin birth. We were not born of virgins without husbands. He was born of a virgin without a human father. And this implies that he did not inherit this humanity we have through the natural human generation process, but rather it was the Holy Spirit who brooded like a hen broods over eggs over Mary and in the process sanctified a womb to generate a pure humanity that we know as Christ Jesus, a humanity that Adam possessed before he was deceived into sin. Now, what I want to do is to move a step further and 
continue with the text in Hebrews chapter 2, which I looked at, which is really an expansion of the text we have in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 7, we ended by saying he emptied himself. And I showed that what he emptied himself of was not the divine nature because that's unchanging with respect to him. He is always God. It was the visible manifestations of that divinity, of that being God, which he laid aside for the purposes of accomplishing our redemption. So, so we must be careful not to say that he emptied himself of being God, because if we do that, it means we are teaching error. The word divine as it was, God as it was, became man. So it was the God man. Um, then I showed further that when the Bible talks about his likeness to us, we should never, never for a moment assume that he had a sinful nature like us. Because there are some people who say that. Then they say, but even if he had a sinful nature like us, he overcame all sin, he whatever. No, he was tempted in every way, just like Adam and Eve were tempted before they sinned. But he was tempted in such a manner that we will never come to know the agonies that he suffered because of those temptations. Nothing was held back by the devil, tempting him, stretching him to the limit. And he was found without sin because he did not stumble. So that he truly can become a high priest for us. Now, what I want to do is to move a step further and focus on Hebrews. But for us to be able to understand what I want to discuss I'm going to, to take a step back. Instead of starting at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2, I am going to start from verse 5. Now, verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 2 reads like this. For it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. Now, the point here that matters is that there is a world to come and there is someone who has been given authority over it. Now, once you say, for it is not to angels that he, who is the he mentioned in this verse? It is the father. He has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. So this verse is saying the father did not subject the world to come to angels, but he subjected it to who? To his son, the heir of all things. This again emphasizes a distinction of persons. You can't say that for it is not to angels that he, Jesus, he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but he subjected it to himself. What's the purpose of making all that roundabout and making secular statements that are meaningless? There is a distinction of persons here. And it's important to emphasize that. Verse 6. But somewhere it is testified in these words. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned, you crowned him with glory and honor. 
and placed everything under his feet. That's the end of the quotation. This is the quotation of a psalm. Notice. Verse 5 started by saying God, meaning the Father, did not subject the world to come to angels, but he subjected it to who? To his son. Now, he now expands that theme by quoting scripture. And he said, scripture testifies to this very thing we just stated, that God is so mindful of men. And the word men there is important to emphasize because it means truly, truly that Jesus became man, not somebody who looked like a man. He was truly man. That you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him. Here it is. You made him a little lower than angels. That is he became what he was not before. That is to say, there is a point in time when he assumed a nature even lower to some of the beings that he created with his own hands. That is the angels. Yet, here, here is the contradiction, not contradiction, but here is the puzzle. You crowned him with glory and honor. That is glory and honor compared to the angels. So even if you made him a little lower than angels, the glory you placed on him, the honor you placed on him far excels that of the angels. And you placed everything, including the angels, under his feet. Now, then, then the, the apostle begins to explain what he just mentioned now. He begins to explain it. Now, let's follow his thought. In, he, he now says, when God subjected all things to him. Now, this is important for us to, to pay attention to because Christians have a problem of not paying attention to words and grammar when they read their Bible. So when you say Jesus is the Father, the Father is Jesus. Here, here let's, let's try to use that understanding and see if things make sense. When God subjected all things to him, who is the him here? The him here is the Son, is Jesus Christ our Lord. But who is God here? When God subjected all things to Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, if the Father and Jesus Christ are the same person, let's try to do that and say, when Jesus Christ subjected all things to Jesus Christ, does that make sense? Does it? So, so you think we humans care more about language, but God doesn't, so he, he can just throw out statements which are meaningless? Can that be true? It clearly means that we are missing something when we read. There are things that we have believed for a very long time and those things blind us. They are like blind folders. They prevent us from seeing what scripture is saying. So when God, meaning the Father, subjected all things to him, he left nothing outside of his control. It literally means everything that you can conceive of is under the feet of Jesus Christ. The Father placed everything under the feet of Jesus Christ. His Son. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subjected to him. You see, this is a commentary given by the writer of the letter to what the psalm says. And he shows that God, meaning the Father, subjected all things to him, meaning the Son, 
he left nothing outside of his control meaning ev literally everything is under the feet of jesus in another psalm which should be psalm 110 david speaking by the spirit says the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies your footstool that's it he subjected everything under his feet there is not a single thing except the father which hasn't been put under his feet yet when we look in the world we are living in now we clearly see that there are certain things that are not yet subjected to him that's what he's saying here now before i proceed with this psalm i want to quickly go to first corinthians first corinthians uh, let's go to first corinthians um verse chapter 15 um let's start from about verse 24 maybe verse 22 for completeness for just as in adam all die so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then when Christ comes, those who belong to him. Then comes the end. In other words, when the resurrection of the saints and the the, the the transformation of those who are alive happens and they meet the lord in the clouds then comes the end there are other things in between there but then comes the end when he who is the he here it's important also to identify every time say him he him he him he what the, who is being referred to by the he or the him you must pay attention to the structure of the verse the the grammar the syntax everything because if you don't do that you end up making erroneous interpretations of scripture now then comes the end when he meaning christ jesus hands over the kingdom to god the father here is a clear clear distinction of persons the personas are different here the son has made rule and subjected everything to himself then he hands over the kingdom to the father when when he is brought to an end all rule and all authority and power which means christ jesus must reign until he has destroyed all rule all power all authority all principality when that is done all thrones then all evil is done away with. He hands over the kingdom to the Father. For he must reign. Who is the he now? For he, meaning Christ Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be eliminated is death. For he has put everything in subjection under his feet. Now, this is an incomplete sentence, as you can see. It's just a, for he has put everything in subjection under his feet. But when it says everything, which is what we read here in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, when God subjected all things to him, that is to Christ, he left nothing outside of his control that is the control of christ here also 
Paul in Corinthians says the same. For he has put everything in subjection under his feet. But when it says everything has been put in subjection, it is clear that this does not include the one who put everything in subjection to him. The distinction of persons is unmistakable. There is one who put things under the feet of another. And that one who put things under the feet of another is not part of the things that under, are under the feet of this one. Do you see that? So that's what Paul is saying. For in saying that the Father put all things in subjection unto Christ Jesus, it is clear that this does not include the Father. That is, the Father can never be under the feet of Jesus. Because it is the Father who is putting things under his feet. And when all things are subjected to him, that is when he has destroyed every power, every principality, every throne, every rule, every kingdom, everything. Then the son himself, the son, himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him. The distinction of persons is clear. The son is somebody who subjected things under him. And who is this somebody? It is the father. This verse, this verse is saying when the son is accomplished his task of destroying every evil power and kingdom and authority and throne and principality and he has destroyed literally every enemy, including the last enemy, which is death. Then the son himself will be subjected to the father so that the father may be all in all. This, my brothers and sisters, is very important. Now, I am at a loss of words because just of the enormity of the things that the Apostle Paul has just described in 1 Corinthians, which is what we are seeing here in Hebrews 2 verse 8. God the Father subjected every, all things to the Son. He left nothing, literally nothing, outside his control. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to him. This is why Paul there says he must continue to rule until he puts an end to all powers, all principalities, all rule, all authority, all thrones. As long as he hasn't done that, he will continue to reign. Now, verse 9, I'm back to Hebrews chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels. That is for a little while. For the time he became flesh, he now became a little lower than angels. That's really the, 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 the wonder of this self-humiliation of Christ. That he created the angels. He created everything according to Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Everything, whether it be visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or powers, principalities or authorities or rule or whatever, they were created by him. That is a description of the hierarchy of the angelic, the angelic order. When you say rule, authority, principalities, whatever, whatever. 
he created all of them yet here he is made a little lower than them for a season so that we see here Christ Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels now notice the word now is very important is showing a transition he was made a little lower than angels when he became incarnate, when he became a human being, when he lived in the earth as a human being. But after his death, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hallelujah. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for every, for everyone. For it became him, now that's verse 10, it became him for whom are all things, and through whom are all things. When we say for whom, it means he is the owner through whom he is the agent for their existence. God did everything through him for them to exist. But why were they being created? They were being created for him, that is his son. So, it became him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He is the author of our salvation. He could not have been an author or the author of our salvation had ye not become a human being first and then suffered death, the very death which is crowned with honor and glory, because it is a death which honors God by declaring his righteousness, according to Romans 3 verse 25, which also delivers men from the wrath of God because that very death is propitiatory, that is, it turns away the wrath of God against sin and sinners. For both he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, the idea that the sanctifier and those who are sanctified are all of one is subject to varied interpretations this phrase which says all of one some think that it means they all belong to god which is fine i tend to agree with that but i think that if you look at the previous verse it is clear that it is his incarnation he is being human, which is the subject of the discussion in all the verses that went past. Who is man? Who is man? You made him a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, to test the death for everyone, but you crowned this death with glory and honor. So, so when he came as a human being, he became one of us. We now both have a human nature. So that's why he says they are all of one in the sense that they are all of one nature. That is the human nature. Because the idea that he sanctifies us, remember, it, this is Levitical language. It is priestly language. The priest had the role of sanctifying the congregation of Israel. 
And according to chapter 5 of Hebrews, every priest who is appointed by God is taken from among men to make intercession for them in things pertaining to God, to make sacrifice for the ignorant and the unlearned. What, what's the point? The, the point he's making is because he is taken from among them, he understands their infirmities, their weaknesses, their failures. He is sympathetic to them. So he makes intercession from a point of understanding them. He truly understands them when they err and sin before God. And that's what the Hebrew says. We have a high priest who is touched by our weaknesses and failures. And for this reason, he is able to make intercession for us. In other words, for him to be an effective high priest for us, he had to be one of us first. Be tempted in every way as we are tempted and overcome. So that when we fail, he understands us and makes intercession for us before God. This is wonderful truth, my friends. This is wonderful truth. So we are all of one. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing thy praise. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom God hath given me. They, the distinction of persons is so clear. The I there is Christ Jesus. God there is the Father who hath given me. Since then, the children are sharers in flesh and blood. That is, they are partakers. He also himself in like manner partook of the same that through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death. Now, the most important part I need from this, I've made a, a running commentary, but the, the most important part I wanted here is this, which says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that you visit him? Why is it important to focus on the point man. Because as I said in my previous installment, many people out there either claim that Christ Jesus was only divine and had a phantom board, which means a board which appears to be human when in fact he is not. Now, the emphasis on men here is very important. He was truly, truly human. And the interpreter here, the writer, shows that that psalm is really speaking about Adam. Which Adam? The second Adam. The last Adam, the second man. Now, what I want to do is to focus on this idea of man. Who is man that you are mindful of him? Now, for us to be able to deal with that, I want us to go to the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. And what I want to do is to focus on, um, I think we should focus on about, from about verse 44. Verse 44. Um, 
maybe from verse 45. Verse 45 says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, that is the one who was created in Genesis, the first man, Adam, became a living person or a living soul. The last Adam, there are no other Adams in between. There is only the first Adam and the last Adam. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, I want to pause there for a while. Here are two men set in context, the first and the last. The first man, the second man. The first Adam, the last Adam. Why does scripture do that? Why does scripture have these two Adams, these two men, the first and the last man? Why? Here is the point. The first Adam was a federal head of the human race, the living souls like him. And as a federal head, God entered into a covenant with the federal head on behalf of his posterity, which had not yet been born and the the covenant which god made with the federal head was binding to all future generations of his kind and so when adam sinned we in him sinned that is his sin is imputed to us is credited to our account. And so we become sinners like him, not because we have sinned, but we were in him when we sinned. When our federal head sinned, we all sinned. Very important. Here is the, fed, the first federal head of the human race. Now that the, the human race has fallen, but God wants to restore this human race to his fellowship. He now sets the second man, the last Adam, again a federal head. He is truly a man. He is truly a man. But he is different from the first because the first was a living soul. This one is a life-giving spirit. That is Christ Jesus. He is our federal head. So that the covenant that he enters into with, with God, that is the Father. His complete obedience of it is credited to us is righteousness if we believe what he did. So that the disobedience of one man, the first Adam, is credited to us as sin and we alongside him fall into condemnation, judgment and death. Similarly, the perfect obedience of the second Adam, that is the last federal head of the human race, is credited to us, if we believe in him, as a righteousness. And by reason of it, we receive favor, blessing, fellowship with the Father, peace with the Father, life, and 
glory. How wonderful this is. So indeed, this man Jesus, the Christ our Lord, was a man. For he had to be the federal head of the new humanity. Now, this is where we need, because notice he is called a life-giving spirit. This can only be true if he was also fully divine, fully God, and fully man. So that if he is fully man, he is our representative. He is our federal head. And because he is also God, he is the source of life. So he is the life-giving spirit. This, this then highlights the point I was making when I was interpreting Hebrews 2 verse 14, which says, For as much as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise also took part in in the same. Then I said, in the original, partakers, children partake of this. Partaking and taking part are different, word, different words. One is koinonia, which just means fellowship, communion. We commune in this humanity. That's who we are. He, on the other hand, he said to, to have mechod, the, the, the Greek word is meko. It means something external to you is added to you. He laid a hold on humanity. He added that humanity to himself. That means he already existed as the spirit. Then he added that humanity to himself from outside him. It means he had his own nature but he added this other nature, the human nature to himself, so that he can drag fallen men from the abyss of condemnation and bring them into the glorious kingdom of light. Oh, this is beautiful. I don't know if you see it. Now, let's continue with 1 Corinthians. Now, we are on verse 46. However, the spiritual did not come first but the natural and then the spiritual, which means it was necessary that the first Adam, the natural man, the soulish man, comes first, then the spiritual second. The first man is from the earth. The is from the earth made of dust. The second man, that is the last Adam, is from heaven. Now, I want to, to stop here a little bit and emphasize this verse. First, notice the first man is from the earth. So, is this man eternal? No way. God forbid. The earth has a beginning. It was not always there. God had to create the heavens and the earth, which means the earth has a beginning. So I've heard some people teaching that man was created first before he was made. This would make man eternal. But notice that the first man, the very first man called Adam, could not be there until the earth was there. So he is man of the earth. He is a beginning of his story. He is not eternal. He is the beginning of his story. He is a man of the earth made from the dust, which means the earth must have been created first before he was. 
But the second man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam, is from heaven. The moment you say is from heaven, it means he had an existence in the spiritual realm as God, because God is spirit. The spirit was there before anything was there. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The very word was God, was fully God. Verse 14, and this very word, which was there in the beginning, became a human being, became flesh. That's what is being described here. The second Adam ascended from the heavens. Here. Yeah. He came down from the heavens, which means he pre-existed. His coming to the earth was not the beginning of his life. He pre-existed his coming to the earth. He was there before anything else was created. But now, for the purposes of saving humanity, according to Hebrews, he was mad or he became a little lower than angels for a little while. That's, that's the point being discussed here. He came down from heaven where he received worship and everything else. And he added unto himself human nature. That is why the writer to Hebrews distinguishes the words he uses. Children partake of flesh, of, of flesh and blood, but he took part. He added it to himself. Whereas children have a beginning of their existence through human generation, but he added it to himself. Which means he existed before he became a human being. He, he came down to drag humanity out of the abyss of condemnation and judgment and wrath. And he added humanity to himself for purposes of testing death for everyone and redeeming us. So the first man indeed was an earthly man, but the second one was a heavenly man. Like the, like the one made of dust, so too are those made of dust. And like the one from heaven, so too are those who are heavenly. Here is the point. So he came down to drag humanity out of the condemnation into which they were plunged by the first Adam, the earthly man. So that he can bring many sons unto glory, according to Hebrews chapter 2. He can bring many sons unto glory. And in bringing so many sons unto glory, they now become like him. Glorious, heavenly beings. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. These truths are too excellent to my ears. I don't know to yours, but they are too excellent for me. Now, what I want to do is to close by saying, the Apostle Paul he has done a lot of comparisons between the first Adam and the last Adam, the first man and the second man. The, those are the only two men. Here by men, we mean the origin of a race, the beginnings of a race. These are the fathers, the, the federal heads. 
So, in, in Romans chapter 5, where he makes another very detailed and informative comparison between Adam and our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I'll just start uh, from about verse 14, although you can start from verse 12. Yet, death reigned from Adam, that is the first Adam, until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam, that is the first Adam, who is a type of the coming one, transgressed. Do you see the point? The Adam of the earth was a shadow, was a type, was a figure of the one who was to come. Hence, the Apostle Paul says, it is impossible for the spiritual to come first and then the natural. It is the natural that comes first, then the spiritual. Correct. So the natural is a shadow of the spiritual. So the first Adam was a figure of the second Adam. So the soulish man was a figure of the spirit giving life man. And indeed, the one who came from heaven was truly man and truly God. And all this he did so that he could ransom us from destruction. I tell you, no human being, no matter how highly regarded they are, could ever satisfy the law of God. Not even Moses, not Abraham, not Jacob. Everybody who was born of a man and a woman who belongs to the tribe, to the rest of the first Adam, fell in Adam and all of us, we were under this cloud of judgment and the wrath of God. We couldn't keep this law. But then, then comes the second Adam, born of a woman in the fullness of the times of God, under the law. And he lived the law and fulfilled it to its utmost perfection. He obeyed it in every point. He upheld the law. He is the one who gave the law. He is the law giver. So he is the only one who could live his law. So he lived it for us. And having lived the law for us, he then took upon himself the punishment for our sins and our ungodliness. The just for the unjust, so that we in him could receive his righteousness, just as in the first Adam we received his condemnation. In this one, we receive his righteousness, his innocence, his uh, the glories and the praise the Father ascribes to him. So that in as much as in this first one we died, in this one who gives life, we live. So that in the first one, as we become slaves to sin and to death, in this one, life and grace reign and prevail through and in us. These are the deep things of God. Now, in winding up, I go back to where I started, just as a way of recapping. I started by saying, there is a clear distinction of persons here, which we cannot run away from, unless we pretend that we really don't understand what scripture says, because scripture is very, very, very plain. And because scripture is very, very plain, we must be careful not to ignore what scripture says. Now, having said that, 
What I want to do is to conclude by saying the father has subjected everything, everything except himself, under the feet of his son. And the son is the father's agent for destroying all rule and principality and power and dominion and kingdom. This is why in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, when that trumpet sounds, the seventh, it is said, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Scripture can, cannot be any clearer than this. Now, so that if people fail to see the distinction of persons, which I've been emphasizing since the first um, uh, the first um, installment, then there's something fatally wrong. For the apostles here are clear in showing that there is someone who is putting things under the feet of Christ Jesus. And this someone is God. But really in many places you will see that Instead of saying God the Father, sometimes apostles just say God, but really they mean God the Father. He has put all things under the feet of his son. And the son is the agent, as the son was the agent of creation, he is also the agent of restoration of all things. He is the agent of destruction of all evil and sin. When he has accomplished all this which the Father gave him to do, he will hand over the kingdom to the Father. At that point, he himself becomes also subject to the Father so that the Father is all in all. Now, if someone cannot see the distinction of persons in such clear passages, I don't know how else they can see this. And so some people try to rationalize and say, no, what is now under the Father is that flesh. That flesh. So what they try to do is now to separate the flesh from the divine person. You see that? Now, I am wise enough to acknowledge that these are mysteries of God. That's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, Great is the mystery of this God we worship. When he says it's a mystery, that's what he means. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. It is difficult for us to understand it, but the fact that it's difficult to understand does not mean that it's not true and does not mean that we should rationalize and explain it away. We must believe scripture as it speaks to us. Now, let me wind up by giving a warning. The Apostle John writes when a lot of teachers had arisen in the church and these fellows were called Gnostics, Gnostics believed that the world we live in is made out of evil matter because it's made out of evil matter. God is a pure spirit. He cannot be in contact with evil matter and he could not have created evil. Now, listen to me. I want you to be, I want you to be clear. So because of that, their claim was God could never become a human being. He could never become a human being. That is, he could never be flesh, which is evil. And so they denied that Christ Jesus truly came as a human being. They just said he was divine, but he was not of the flesh. Of course, later on, 
um, Arias came up with his teaching and he was saying Jesus was only human and not divine, the extreme opposite of the Gnostics. But when John wrote, it was the Gnostic teaching which was troubling the saints. Oh, Jesus. He's just a divine. He can't be human. So then John comes down like a ton of bricks on false teachers. And you read his first, second, third episodes. He is like a ton of bricks. And he is trying to emphasize this issue of understanding the person of our Lord and his relationship to the Father. You can't say the Son is the Father, the Father is the Son. The, there is a distinction of persons. What we struggle to understand is how they become one or how they are one. But the fact that we, we, we struggle to understand that does not give us a license to conflate them and say the Father is the Son, the Son is the Father. There is clear distinction of persons on every page you read. A, a clear distinction. Now, let me wonder. Now, here the Apostle John in, in 1 John, let's start from chapter 2. I'll just read one or two verses. Um, verse, let's start from about verse 22. Who is the liar? But the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Now remember, Christ is the Hebrew word Messiah. That is the anointed one. So he's saying, who is a liar? But him who denies that Christ Jesus is the long-awaited for Messiah. If you don't accept that he is the Messiah who has been promised since the days of Adam up to now, you are a liar. Now, this one is the Antichrist. Listen to how strong the words are. The person who denies the Father and the Son. Now, I hear people talking about this, this verse all the time. But because we are used to saying the Father is the Son, the Son is the Father, we gloss over it and we don't really listen to the grammar, the syntax, and what he's saying. The person who denies that we have the Father and we have the Son is separate persons who are one, who are inseparably one. Yet they are two persons. That's what he's saying. So the moment you say the father is the son, the son is the father, you have conflated them. You are doing that because to you it is difficult to see that that's what the scripture says. You are trying to rationalize it as in your carnal mind. You are trying to rationalize it. How can we have, how can we have two persons? It's just the same one who is he is the father, he is the son, he is the father, he is the son. That's what you're saying. Everyone who denies the son does not have the father either. The person who confesses the son has the father also. Now, this is really very, very important. I don't want to take this far, but at some point I will come and plow through this discussion by the Apostle John. If you deny the Father and the Son, if you can't understand the distinction of persons who are one in every sense, then you risk Falling into this category, John condemns, which is the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul is very clear in Corinthians. The Father subjects things under the feet of the Son. If you say the Father and the Son, uh, the Father is the Son and the Son is the Father, then you are saying 
the son subjected things to the father. Can we do it that way? Or can we say the son subjected things to the son or the father subjected things to the father? Those are nonsensical statements with all due reference. They don't make sense. There is a distinction of persons which we cannot run away from, which we must understand. And even if we cannot explain it fully, we must believe it because that's how scripture puts it. We are not here to rationalize things, but to believe the word of God as it puts things across to us. There we have it. I leave you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.